Okay. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for showing up. I want to talk about how to save the energy system. And actually, the point is I don't want just to talk about how to save the energy system, but I want to enable you to go out and save the energy system because that's something to do. And Ted is about ideas worth spreading, but it's not good enough to have an idea. We take it, need to take it to action. So what you can expect from my talk is a kind of checklist that you have to keep in mind when you go out and start saving the energy system. Now, why am I the person to give out a checklist how to save the energy system? Now, the point is that there are uh, quite a few people in the world that work on saving the energy systems, and quite a few of them sent emails to me once they solved the problem. So, and so I get emails, dear Professor Bardo, I just saved the energy systems. Could you please take a look, look at my design and certify that it's a brilliant idea? Now, and these people have investing their time and dedication to saving the energy systems, but to be quite honest, they all screw up. And it's heartbreaking to see that they are screwing up, and they are screwing up because they don't know a set of simple rules that you have to keep in mind when you start saving the energy system. So what I want to provide you with is a set of simple rules you have to keep in mind when you start saving the energy system. So that's the first group of people I want to talk to today. There's a second group of people that actually will never start working on saving the energy systems, and these are my best friends from high school. They are not in engineering at all. They're not really interested in engineering, but what we do, we meet once a year, we drink, and then we start about talking about global challenges and what you should do. Now, and this, so we talk about the energy problem, and they are citizens, and they read stuff, and they go to me and say, you know what? I read a thing from this great inventor who came, saved the energy system, and he sent an email to professors. They all rejected him. The big companies are rejecting him. Is there not a big conspiracy going on, and they are preventing from having these brilliant ideas out? So even if you're not interested in saving the energy system yourself, maybe you are a fan of conspiracy theories, so I want to provide you with information that actually there's no conspiracy going on. I should make one disclaimer. These are actually not my friends from high school. I didn't ask whether I, I was allowed to show them, and I might tell not nice stuff about them, so it's just a, pictures from the internet. But I do have friends, yeah, so <laughs> in, in case you care. So what's the most important and most frequent mistakes when people start saving the energy system. The most frequent mistake people are making, and that's what people do in a lot of situations when they start working on a problem, they do not understand what's the problem actually. So there's a first group of people, they go out for action, let's save the energy system, and they believe the problem is that we don't have sufficient energy. It's not enough, we need more energy. And you all heard probably of peak oil, that we're running out of oil. Let's look at the facts. So what you see here is data on the known world reserves of oil over the last 50 years. And you all are aware that we are using oil like crazy. Still, the world reserves are going up. Why are the world reserves going up? Now, we are as a society crazily addicted to oil. And so we invent more and more technologies where to find oil. And we are good at it. We have good engineers, most from Aachen, but uh, we have good engineers and they are very successful at finding more oil. The truth is actually that we know so much oil reserves today that we know for sure we should never touch them. If you want to keep the two degrees ta climate target, we should only not touch a third of the known reserves. So people say the Stone Age didn't end because of a lack of stones. So the Oil Age has to end, but not because of a lack of oil. So the point is, you don't have to look for more energy. So that's not the problem. So there's a second group of people. They say, OK, if it's not oil running out, but the point is oil is too dirty, climate emissions, so we have a lack of clean energy. This is a world map. And it's colored by the amount of electricity you could generate from solar irradiation and photovoltaics. What's the size of the planet we need to cover by photovoltaics to provide energy for the whole global world demand? This is the area. It's nothing. 
It's substantial, it's the size of England, but still you see globally we have far more clean energy than we could ever dream of. So it's not a problem to go out and hunt for clean energy, we have more than enough. The sun is providing more than enough clean energy, the wind is providing more than clean energy, but if you are living on this planet, you might be aware that there's a problem actually that, uh, that wind and sun is not always available and you might in some situations sit in the dark when, uh, when, uh, when you're dreaming uh, to have some energy. So the problem with the renewable energy, we have way enough, but we don't have it at the right time. But to be quite honest, that's also not the problem. Because some of you might be available of some technology how to solve this problem. And I hope you can see this. Because we invented something called a battery, which is energy storage. And so I can combine my renewable energy systems, which is not always available, and we call this which is not dispatchable. But I can combine it with a battery system, and then I have clean, dispatchable energy. And that's the thing we are needing. And the technology is available. You all know batteries. You all know energy storage. And the only problem why we're not using renewable energy sources plus energy storage is money. This stuff is too expensive. So we are not buying it. So we are not installing it. So in case you go out to save the energy system, to come up with new energy technology, I want you to find energy technology which is clean, it should be dispatchable, so I should be able to turn it off as I like, and it has to be cheap, otherwise we will not be using it. And this is somewhat sobering, but we still have to look into the economics of renewable energy systems because the economics is particularly bad for renewable energy systems. Now, I'm a professor here at RWTH, so I have to show you one equation. But this is the most ugliest equation you're going to be seeing. And actually, the point is I want to make is why are renewable energy systems intrinsically expensive? Now, the economics of renewable energy systems are actually quite simple. So I'm selling electricity and I get paid for it. That's the money I'm making. I do have to invest money to run my system. There's operating cost and I have to buy the stuff in the beginning. That's investment cost. Now, in order to explain these things in more detail, I invite my three friends from high school to take care of the different parts. And the first guy I want to introduce to you is Owen. Owen stands for operating cost, and you might get this name. And he's a good guy to take care of the operating cost of renewable energy systems because he's the lazy guy in our crowd. He's never on time, he never answers our emails, I think he never studied, he had the biggest drinking record in his student town and blah, blah, blah. So he's really the lazy bum. He made a beautiful career. I don't know how he do it. That's probably a topic for a TED talk. But uh, he is the perfect person to take care of the operation of a renewable energy system. Why? Do you remember a coal-fired power plant? Have you ever seen a coal miner? That's ugly work, that's hard work, that's hard labor. How about a wind miner? A sand miner? That comes for free. So that's a perfect job for Owen. Operating a renewable energy system is basically for free. So actually it's not expensive to run a renewable energy system. And we see this in the economics. So what you see on this slide is the price for electricity in Germany over the course of a day and averaged over different years. And what you see is that the price has been dropping dramatically in the last couple of years. And part of the reason the price has been dropping dramatically is because the price is based on the operating cost. We run more renewable energy systems, so the energy actually becomes cheaper through renew renewable energy systems. So the operating cost is not the problem. The problem is I have to buy the stuff. So the investment cost is the problem. And that's a real challenge for renewable energy systems. And that's the thing for Ian. Ian was born on a bazaar. So he's the guy who is always fighting with you for money, getting bargains, asking for discounts. So it's, he's really a pain if you go shopping with him. 
And asking for bargains and discounts, that's the trick in renewable energy systems. So let's imagine the situation that we're building three power plants, one based on wind, one based on photovoltaics, and one conventional fossil-based power plants, one megawatt each. We love the power plant, we go out, let's build a second power plant somewhere else, and we double the size. How would we do it? The wind power plant is quite simple. I install two wind turbines. The photovoltaics is quite simple. I say I install twice the area. What do you do with the power plant? You build one bigger power plant. And that means I get a discount. Because if you go shopping, and you buy not two small packs, but you buy the one big pack, you get a discount. And the same discount you get in a power plant. And we even put this into an equation. We say there's a six-tenth rule for power plants. So increasing the size, the cost does not increase linearly, but only by six-tenths. And the effect is enormous. If we go from one wind turbine, which has about one megawatt, to the size of a power plant, which has 1,000 megawatts, the costs go up by a factor of 1,000. If we do the same thing with a power plant and apply the 6 tenths rule, the costs go up by a factor of 60 only. What does this mean? The cost increase is not twice as much. Please look, I changed the scale. It's not five times as much. It's 16 times more expensive to scale up a renewable energy system because it does not get the discount we call economy of scale. So intrinsically, your renewable power plant has to be cheap, very cheap, because you don't get the benefit if you go large scale. So that's one problem with renewable energy. So if you go hunting and you find something that obeys the 610 rule, you are in business. So start looking for this. Because the business you're going to be making adds a second problem to your economics. How much money do you make from a power plant? It's quite easy. You get the price for electricity times the kilowatt hours you are generating. And that's the task for Sam. Sam is uh, a guy I used to live with. And Sam is a great cook. And one, time, one day Sam came home and he was in tears of joy. Because he has been shopping and he found a frying pan for steaks. And it was on sale. So for only 10 euros, he bought a frying pan for steaks. And he was in tears. That was the most beautiful days in his life. Such a bargain! Now the point is, I was the guy who lived in this apartment to the very end. So I know for sure how often we used this frying pan. We used it one time. So, what's the point? So you have to add the full 10 euros you invested in the frying pan to the one steak we have been frying in this pan. This is the most expensive, expensive steak we have been ever having. So that was not a bargain, it was ridiculously expensive. And the point is, if you make an investment, you have to use the stuff, otherwise it's expensive. Let's look how we are using renewable energy technologies. Let's say you buy for 10 euros a solar plant, a wind plant, or a fossil plant. This is the operating hours systems are running in Germany. Now, unfortunately, if I invest my money in a solar plant, it runs only 10% of the time. Wind, roughly 20%, and a fossil plant runs 80% of the time. So, the point is, I have to take the investment and add the cost to these little electricity I'm generating, so this electricity has to be much more expensive than this one or the one running on the, on the power plant. So actually, buying a solar system is like buying a frying pan for steaks if you don't have steaks every day. Buying a fossil power plant, you have steaks every day, so the cost of buying the pan is much less important. So the point you have to keep in mind is that it's all the energy technology you're developing for renewable energy has to be cheap, intrinsically very cheap, because otherwise it will not take place. And that takes me to an invention a guy really sent to me one day. So this is taken from an email an inventor sent to me, who said, I saved the energy system. And usually these, these graphics look like this. And to be quite honest, it's not the thing because I promised to him I would not share it with everybody, anybody because he wants to pin, uh, protect his patents and IP because he just saved the energy system, you know? 
And usually these pictures are very complicated and there's top secret things going on there. I tell you what I do with these things. First, I check whether it's a perpetuum mobile. And for this, I forget about all the details. I just make a big box around it and I apply the laws of thermodynamics. So first thing is the first law of thermodynamics, which basically says, is there more energy coming out than coming in? The guy was fine. Then I applied the second law of thermodynamics, which basically tells you, ah, you cannot even break even, so that you have to lose some energy quality in coming. This guy was fine, so he, di he didn't invent a perpetual mobile, so that was fine. So we looked into more detail what this guy has been doing. And if you look carefully, what he was assuming that he had dry air, very dry air coming in and water. What can you do with dry air? Dry air can suck up water. So you can evaporate water with very dry air. What do you do in a power plant? I burn coal to evaporate water. So given his very dry air, he was able to evaporate water. Now if you looked, how often do we have in Aachen the air this guy needed? As you all know, in Aachen we never have dry air. In the places in the world where they do have dry air, they don't have the water. So basically, what he was lacking is the laws of real life. So he invented a beautiful thing, so too complicated still, but this plant will never run. So what I wanted to show you is that solving the energy problem is really not just a one-faceted problem, but you really have to have a set of nuts and bolts tied together to ensure that your energy system is clean, it's dispatchable, and it's cheap. And with cheap technology, you are at the disadvantage with renewable energy. So if you go out now and start working on saving the energy systems, I have been missing the most important point, actually. And this is the point we've been hearing before this morning. That is, why should you actually save the energy system? And that brings me big to the economic slide. Because I've been emphasizing the economics as a big problem, which it is. But actually, that's a good message. It's only the economics that is a problem. Compare the energy system to things like cancer. Even with all the money in the world, we could not self, uh, solve cancer today. We could so, uh, solve the energy problem if we are, we are willing to. And the point is that it's, on this slide, it's not the economics, it's actually the profit that is on the left. So the, point, the reason all of us are not saving the energy system it's because we are rich people that are thinking about the investment and the interest you make on your bank account and your stock, and you're not investing your money in energy system because you don't like the profit. It's not big enough. You invest into something else. So the problem I've been discussing is a problem of rich people. It's also of everybody using electricity. We pay 4% of our income for energy, and we are not paying, willing to pay more because we want to attend TED Talks, I want to go on vacation, I want to do other stuff. You are not willing to invest the money in it. So for us, solving the energy problem is a luxury. And we are not willing to pay for this luxury. But you need to go out there and solve the energy problem because there are people on this planet. For them, the access to energy is not a luxury. These are people dying because they don't have access to water, to medicine, and they need a basic energy system. And by the way, that are the same people that are suffering from us polluting the, the planet. So what I want to do, uh, you have go outside, save the energy system for these uh, people, and I'm looking forward to your emails. Thank you very much.